Good evening. My name is Aileen Tanafranca. And on behalf of the NYU Myers Alumni Association and Re recent Alumni Council, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event entitled New Grads, Are They Practice Ready? We have a diverse panel speaking on this topic tonight, and it is my honor to introduce them. Albert Valero is a Senior Director in Professional Practice at NYC h, &H Office of Patient-Centered Care. Alan Lee is a recent graduate from NYU Myers and is a registered nurse at Mount Sinai Hospital. Fidel Lim is a clinical associate professor at NYU Myers College of Nursing. He has worked as a critical care nurse for more than 18 years. Natalie Pesklinski is executive director of simulation learning at NYU Myers College of Nursing. Vanessa Pino is a recent graduate from NYU Myers and is a registered nurse at New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell. Renee Sanchez is a director of patient care services Magnet Program and Nursing Quality at Northwell Health. Dr. Lim will be moderating the discussion with the help of Alumni Association Board and Committee members, Joseph Corto, Marianne Patterson, and myself. I will now turn the program over to Dr. Lim. Thank you very much, uh, Eileen. And uh, I'm very excited to moderate uh, this uh, presentation. And we'll start with a slide because no presentation happens without a slide. So we do have a slide. So uh, Janet will share a slide that will sort of inform what's coming up, what type of uh, discussion we'll be uh, uh, seeing uh, and hearing. So. Um, the question whether new grads are practice ready or are they not is not new, right? Um, when I say this, I am referring to when Nightingale brought her nurses to Crimea in 1854. She brought 38 nurses. She was asking the same things. Uh, are they able to work in that level of care that they were getting into in the war zone? In, uh, so, so the question has been hanging around for a very long time. So our context right now is a little bit different. So I have a question, is it an impossibility? Can we actually have new grads that will come out of nursing school who will be ready? Okay, so, but why is this so complicated? So the slides is telling us some of these complexities. So we train the uh, uh, nursing students at a generalist level, but practice these days, you and I, know this now for sure, is very specialized. For example, uh, oncology, coronary, neurology. So all of those practice uh, uh, sites have very specialized equipment. They have specialized diagnosis that we don't actually teach in school. So you're discovering them after you get into the job. As the stakes get higher, right? Regulations, laws, staffing, the stakes are higher, but the program is shorter. Did you know that there are now nursing programs as short as 10 months? You could become a nurse in 10 months. Think about that, right? Um, and then we rely on the NCLEX as a way to usher the new grad into the uh, profession. However, and this is true in any professional jobs, medicine, social work, physical therapy, anything that has a board exam. A board exam is not a proxy for competency, okay? You pass the test because you pass the test. It doesn't mean you're a good provider, right? So it is a, 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 uh, an unreliable uh, gauge of how a RN would actually do the work. And then uh, for a very long time, since the 80s, we have been using Benner's model from a new nurse novice to an expert. And when you go on orientation, and Vanessa and Alan can talk about this in their experience, you come in, you are being oriented, but you're actually being judged at a competent and proficient level when in fact, you're coming in at a novice background. So the disconnect, the expectation is here, but you are here, right? So that affects the way you are evaluated so to speak. And according to Benner and her uh, experiments and studies in the 80s, it takes about two years for a person to be at a competent and proficient level. We want you to do it in six weeks, okay? 
And we have simulation, we have wonderful technology, and this is great stuff. We have science that says it works, it's effective, we can make safe clinicians. But because of context of what happens, we are uh, facing a sort of a uh, um, confusion as to whether we should use it more or we should uh, rely on face-to-face uh, -face, uh, clinical encounter as the you know, the bedrock of clinical expertise. So uh, we can discuss that tonight. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Paslinski, who is uh, our clinician, uh, clinical simulation uh, expert. And then the pandemic, which explains just about everything in, 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 in what's happening in the last two and a half years, right? So at Myers, we are very lucky that we were actually able to accelerate uh, a lot of our uh, program programming into uh, back into in person and so on. So, uh, guess what's happening at the moment, right? We are sort of emerging, re-emerge from the pandemic, but now our the faculty is now emerged from the pandemic. The student is not. They are still in the Zoom land. <laughs> And I say this not as a criticism to the student and audience, but I'm saying is we're moving in different speeds here, right? I want to be back in person, but the, 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 the social context sometimes prevents us from doing that. So that's the background. And I would add one thing that's not in here. Uh, the education and practice is a little disconnected. So for example, they survey new grads asking them, what is it that you do in the job? that you find very challenging and very important in your job. One of the things that the new grad says, admitting a patient, admission. Uh, I don't know if Vanessa and Alan has the same sentiment, you know, admitting your first patient from the emergency room, it's very nerve wracking, but think about it. We don't give you that opportunity to practice that in undergrad. It doesn't exist at all, right? So. We're expecting you to be good at admitting patient, going to do 86 pages of paperwork and 69 drop-down menus, but we don't give you the opportunity. So having said that, uh, I'm now gonna start my first question. And my colleagues here and I will take turns uh, asking the question. So this first question is for Vanessa and Alan. Um, Tell us one or two things you wish you learned in nursing school before you became an RN. So one or two things that you could say, you know, I wish I'd known that stuff before I signed up for this. So let's start with you, Vanessa. Well, first I'd like to say hello. Um, my name is Vanessa Pino. I'm a new grad uh, nurse. I currently work in the CCU at New York Presbyterian Hospital in Cornell. And I've been there for about seven months. Um, one or two things that there's a lot of things I wish I learned in nursing school. Um, one of them definitely being the dynamics between I a nurse and the residents and the people you are working with on the floor. I don't think I valued or understood how important those relationships are. And that's not something I feel like they ever mentioned to me on how I would have to go up to the doctor and say, hey, I really need you to do this <laughs> without feeling like um, I'm stepping on some toes and you have to really learn how to trust your gut as a nurse. And it's, it's really intimidating as a new grad, um, especially in like a high intensity floor. And I wish that's something at least mentioned to me in nursing school, but I think that's really hard to teach. Um, and it's something that comes with experience, but that's one thing I definitely wish I had learned. Uh, that, that's a great insight, Vanessa. And again, that's one of those things that are difficult uh, to arrange uh, somehow, or but it can be arranged because I used to uh, make sure that my students you know, had an interaction with the cardiologist. So. Yeah, so if there's any clinical instructor uh, in this gathering, uh, keep keep that in mind. Alan? Hey, everyone. My name is Alan. Uh, I graduated from NYU Myers in January of 2021. I've been working at Mount Sinai Hospital on the Upper East Side and in the medical ICU uh, with Joseph Curto, uh, one of our committee members, um, for about one and a half years now. And one of the things I wish I learned in nursing school was well, they kind of go over it, but is to really take care of yourself and um, don't sacrifice your physical or mental health for um, the job. 
what I mean by that is like always protect yourself. If you have a patient that's in contact and they're having an emergency where there would be a code or, you know, they're desaturating, you know, put on your PPE, protect yourself first. And if a patient is falling, don't try to catch them. And, you know, it's a sentinel event, but you don't want to harm yourself for the job. Um, and to echo of what Vanessa said, dynamics, working with other people, that, that is something that, you know, you it, it's not something that you can teach in school. It's something that you learn on the job. And so, you know, that is, yeah, I definitely agree with that. So thank you for that. So uh, maybe later on, you can add more on that, on how do you actually learn it on the job? I had uh, once a student uh, pick up the phone to ask the provider if they could remove the folia, and the student started sobbing. I mean, terrorized by the prospect of asking someone to say, hey, doc, can we remove the Foley catheter? So, um, I, of course, I will never put somebody in a ter ter terrifying uh, uh, situation. So great answers. Thank you so much. So um, I'll hand in the next question to Joe to ask our panel. Hello. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. OK, good, because I can't hear all of a sudden. But um, anyways, my name's Joe. I work at Mount Sinai. I'm one of the nurse practitioners in the medical ICU with Alan. We actually work together. Um, so I have this question that's going to be directed actually towards Albert. Um, and as far as the question goes, uh, Vanessa or Alan could probably chime in afterwards also if one of them had experienced the uh, residency program. Um, how are you preparing your preceptors to enhance practice readiness of your new grads? and are your hospitals using new grad residency programs for new nurses? Thank you, Joe. Can everybody hear? So I'm Albert uh, Bellaro. I'm here uh, on the invite of Dr. Theodore, uh, who works with me at New York City Health and Hospitals. We are both alums of New York University. So I'm not a new graduate, as you can tell, but every time I come to work, um, I always go back to that memory of when when I was a new graduate. How did it feel like? How did it look like? And how did I practice? So to answer your question, Joe, uh, we run uh, the nurse residency program at New York City Health and Hospitals. And part of that is making sure that they have preceptors in their units. And so one of the ways that we prepare our preceptors is through a uh, structured curriculum that's evidence-based coming from the Vermont nurse uh, in um, nurse in uh, in practice, VNIP. I'm not sure if I'm getting the, the definition right, um, but that's a structured program that we've adopted at our Council of Nurse Educators. And what that does is define the preceptor role a little bit more for our preceptors, because a lot of times when you don't prepare preceptors, most of them have a preconceived notion that it's all about teaching the new graduates. So it turns out that preparing preceptors is more than just teaching the new graduates. Uh, it's, it's socializing them to their new environment. And it's also uh, uh, becoming a, uh, a resource for clinical questions that uh, the new graduates have. And, from that assumption that uh, new graduates come to you, you know, uh, with all the knowledge base, but are they putting it in context and are they putting it in the, uh, um, the decision that fits the patient situation right in front of them? You see, there's a difference between what you learn in school with case scenarios and the patient who's right in front of you with different needs, different characteristics and different context in life. So that's the challenge that we have with our preceptors. Uh, we are like all other hospitals are struggling in terms of making our preceptors, you know, uh, optimized, meaning the number of preceptors. Uh, a lot of times we are stuck in a situation where uh, the nurse who's two years on the job becomes a preceptor right away because um, we don't have enough preceptors uh, that, um, really are enthusiastic to do the job. A lot of the preceptor role is not just, you know, being told to do so, but also liking it because if if they don't like the role, then it turns out that the experience for the new graduate also becomes not so good. 
So that's a little bit of a brief on how we uh, prepare our preceptors uh, for our new grads. Uh, Albert, is uh, how long is the residency program at H, uh, HC? Um, we have a residency program, the largest in the country. Um, we our, our program length is about is twelve months. Uh, so after orientation, it's not optional for them to uh, not go into the uh, nurse residency program. So we make it a part or, or continuation of their orientation. So they're automatically enrolled in our nurse residency program uh, after finishing orientation. So um, as you said, Dr. Lim, typically orientation runs about six weeks, but uh, as we discovered, um, a lot of orientation uh, mostly runs beyond six weeks. So it's a different kind of onboarding uh, time for us. Uh, typically it's six weeks after date of hire, but for specialty areas, sometimes they orient uh, for six months. And so we take them after the six months and then uh, they continue into the nurse residency program. Is that actually uh, just a question actually, Albert? Is that across like all facets of nursing and like all crit like areas, clinical areas, like right down to med surge, right up to ICU? Or um, is it just specific like uh, specialty areas? Like if you're an ED nurse versus like an, an ICU nurse? as far as the residency program? Our program touches all specialty areas, uh, behavioral health, critical care, med surge, and the content of our programs are in general nursing, um, uh, concept-based kind of a uh, delivery method of content. So what we do is not so much we specialize on critical care, about drips, for example, but we deliver content on changing patient condition, which applies to everybody, no matter where you are. We talk about general topics uh, as well, such as um, you know relationships with your coworkers, interprofessional communication, end of life care, which is typical no matter where you are. So it's it touches all specialties. It's not it's not specialized in one area. We even have uh, uh, nurse residents that are coming from correctional health from post-acute care and from Gotham Health, which is our ambulatory care network. So it touches all specialties. Uh, thank you. That's that's wonderful. I mean, that sounds great. I wish I had had something like that back in the day to be able to go through. Um, I will turn it over now actually to Eileen. Um, she's going to be asking the next question. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, this question is for Vanessa. So Vanessa, have you completed a nurse residency program and you know discuss ways in which you experience uh, being part of a nurse nurse residency program and how it impacted your role as a new nurse? Yeah, thank you, Eileen. Um, so I'm currently in a nurse residency program. I find it a little difficult to say that I think a lot of people are starting off in residency programs. Most of my friends from undergrad are in residency programs. Um, our res residency program here at New York Presbyterian really hones in on, they grab all of us from any specialty. There's no specific um, groups for ICU or anything like that. And we go over general um, conversations and they create a really safe space for us as new grads to talk about our experiences and our, the um, Kelly who's in charge of our uh, residency program. She's really good at saying, whatever you say to me, we'll stay here unless I think it's very, very dangerous and we will escalate it. But she tries to create an area for us to talk about mistakes and to talk about things that happen. Um, they do their best to teach us um, general things about nursing, but that's something that just comes with the floor and you just have to learn it with experience. But there's something really nice about the residency program where once a month I get to go in and talk to people who are experiencing the same feelings as I am, um, who get to reflect on certain you know, situations and escalating care is also really um, a big conversation we have. We also talk about um, improving hospital policies. You know, they ask us about ways that we that we find as fresh eyes on the unit. How can we? Do you see anything we think we can improve? And at the end of our residency program, we do a um, 
project, um, like you would do in nursing school, like an EBP um, project, um, that PICO question will follow you forever. Um, <laughs> and it gives you a really good chance to reflect on your unit, see what, they don't ask me to fix anything. They just want me, they want me to show that I can read um, evidence-based practice and if I can see where we need to improve. And if you like research, it's really fun. Um, I'm really grateful for having a residency program, but then again, a lot of things that come with learning to be a nurse as a core comes from the floor. And I think that floor experience with preceptors and things make a very big difference. Okay, thank you so much for that feedback. Um, yeah, um, a lot of uh, new grads um, have, you know, de de definitely a different perspective. Um, okay, I'll turn the question or send it to Joe for the next question. Hello again, I'm gonna direct this question actually to Renee. Um, in the current climate of constant precepting and training of new grads, how do you support your preceptors and what, uh, you know, resources and stuff do you have available for them? So hi everyone. Um, again, just a reintroduction. I'm Renee Sanchez. I'm one of the magnet program directors with within Northwell and also director of nursing quality and a graduate from a master's program at NYU in 2013. So um, given the workforce and the climate right now, there is a lot of turnover. So we're constantly onboarding new nurses. So yes, there is a lot of um, things going on with the preceptors. So it's it's challenging at times. So really to support them, uh, we do a great job, at least I feel at, at Northwell. Um, we do things such as um, providing recognition to our preceptors. We have a preceptor appreciation day. We honor them during nurses week. We also provide feedback. Um, we do a lot of one-to-one -one with them to see what the needs are as a group, as a whole, like the preceptors coming together and meeting and debriefing on like what the needs are and what we could best to do to support them in their practice. Um, and also rotating them too, because a lot of times, uh, I know Alan and Vanessa can probably attest to this, but you'll have one primary preceptor and then maybe a secondary preceptor. So they'll rotate um, just to kind of balance the load because uh, there is a lot of like, you know, onboarding with new nurses. And then Another thing we do, um, we have a formal mentorship program at Northwell. So we have two tracks, one for leadership and one for uh, the RN clinical nurse. So a lot of our um, new nurses will be paired with the mentor. So it's different from you know having a preceptor. So then the preceptors themselves can have mentors as well. So it's it's it's, it's a, we we try to like do a lot for them because we understand that the complexities and the demands that they they face, especially with our given our workforce climate right now. So it is a lot, but we try to you know get feedback from them and you know evaluate our processes and our orientation and constantly work at supporting them. So yeah. That, that is great, Renee. Um, I actually have a follow-up question for that. Uh, and briefly, uh, the reason uh, I want to ask this question is we are seeing more and more new grads getting into the charge nurse role, even only after three months off orientation. So are your preceptors training the new grad to be a charge nurse? I, I just spoke with someone last night. He's a travel nurse, gets his assignment, and guess what? On the first day, he's, a, he's assigned as a charge nurse. A travel nurse wow. is the charge nurse. That's a little crazy for me, but that's the kind of things we are seeing more and more. So, I mean, in my institution, we do have assistant nurse managers that kind of take on that role. Um, we don't really, if we have a unit that does have a charge nurse, it's typically a nurse with more experience. We try to kind of uh, mitigate that with our leadership, our frontline leaders. So um, we don't necessarily, um, you know, support having new grads as charge nurses because we know that that's not the best thing to do for their practice. So, uh, like I said, I don't know. I can't speak to the other hospitals. I just know for Northwell, we do have uh, assistant nurse managers, or we'll have more experienced nurses um, who are more uh, developed have kind of be in that role just to support the, you know, the throughput and the discharges and the admissions. It's a, it's a lot to ask for a new grad to do that. Yeah, yeah, great, uh, good to know. So I think for our new grads in the audience, that might be uh, something to ask when you're shopping for places to work. So 
All right, we're going to change uh, um, topic. We're going to move on to the simulation uh, um, world. And this question is for Natalie. What types of activities do you do uh, uh, and orchestrate in the sim lab to accelerate the transition to practice of uh, new grads? So uh, are there any new initiatives that Myers is doing to allow this to happen quicker and uh, more competency-based and those sort of things? So uh, let us know. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you, Dr. Lim. And that's a great question. We are always doing lots of things at the Simulation Center at Myers. And, you know, one of the great things, and this is to piggyback off what Vanessa was saying earlier, is that we get to practice in a controlled, safe environment, right? And so, uh, you know, besides seeing clinical scenarios that progress in the level of difficulty from the beginning of the program to the end of the program where you even have multiple patients at a certain point within simulation, I think that uh, we are evolving the students' thinking into how to make those clinical decisions and clinical judgments for the uh, patients, uh, the correct pa patient at the right time. And, you know, I, I think anybody could learn how to draw blood or how to put in an IV line. And like many of uh, you mentioned, you know, you learn this on, on the job. And these are things that we don't teach uh, in the curriculum. I mean, Dr. Lim does have a special um, uh, simulation where he does offer that in his uh, co uh, complex health uh, topics course for his students. And I think that's a great opportunity, but, you know, we don't teach those kinds of technical skills and, you know, we want to develop the clinical reasoning and decision-making. And, you know, now that, um, the uh, now that nursing education is moving towards competency based uh, education, you know, we are going to create more types of scenarios where it is competency based, right? And 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 what is really competency? You have to do something over and over again, uh, I think, in order to become truly competent, uh, you know, in, in a certain skill, but to at least provide, um, you know, the, the pipeline and pave the way for students to be able to develop those skills, I think is really critical and important. One of the things that we did, which was a large initiative, was to bring an EPIC into the simulation center. And I think that uh, that was critically important to do because not, you know, students are getting to see you know, the, just the, how the screen looks alone, uh, you know, besides all the d various tabs and getting to see that over and over and over again in simulation and, and charting and playing around with it. And, you know, whether you're doing something right or, or not will, will be discussed, but having that experience hands-on prior to going into the clinical setting um, and working as a registered nurse, I think, um, provides, you know, groundwork for uh, just learning the system faster, you know, being more, uh, more in, you know, aware and, and you're able to navigate uh, a lot better and faster, I think. So these are, this is just one of the things. Um, as um, you know, Vanessa was speaking also about orientation and how it's so great to, you know, meet up once a month with the group, you know, that started with you and you're all kind of going through, through, you know, maybe different experiences, but, you know, you're all at the same type of uh, novice to expert climbing the, the ladder level. And, you know, I, I think about debriefing as that, as that opportunity, right? And so it's great because students get to do that six times uh, in a semester in simulation and not even once every month. And again, it's a safe environment and 
Sure, make mistakes. That's why you're here and ask questions if you have any. Uh, you know, the other really great initiative that we have, and uh, my assistant director, Gina Robertello, came up with this idea. Uh, it's for our uh, fourth sequence students, our uh, students in our last semester in our leadership course. And we have a simulation, and it's called Friday Night in the ER. And it's a board game. And this goes back to speaking about when Renee and Alan, were, you guys were speaking about uh, admissions and just, you know, how, you know, it's not a good idea to give, you know, a new grad, put, put them in this position to make these kind of critical decisions about staffing and, you know, which patient goes where and all this type of movement. So this particular game does exactly that. It gives the students an opportunity to, you know, their teams and they're competing with each other and it gets kind of pretty competitive. Um, and, and it's a lot of fun, but it gives students, you know, the opportunity to um, at least experience, you know, all the factors that play a role in the decision-making that goes into uh, admissions, transfers, discharges, and, and so on. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention is um, interprofessional education, IPE. And this, again, sorry, Vanessa, I keep on pinging back on <laughs> what you were saying. Um, but, <clears throat> and Alan, you know, you also mentioned this as well, but you know, our interprofessional experiences, we are involved in, and again, this is not in simulation, this is right now in the actual clinical setting. Uh, we have a group of nursing students, uh, and during their clinicals, they're working together with medical students and really planning and discussing patient care uh, for their assigned patients. And they join rounds and they uh, discuss what the plan is going to be with each other. And again, getting to know the different roles, responsibilities, and just, you know, to have that open line of communication, you know very quickly a story, you know, even though um, I've been a nurse for 18 years already, I will never ever forget how it felt to be a new grad. And uh, it was very frustrating. And, and I had anxiety every time I had to, uh, you know, going to work, but, you know, about the communication with the residents and the attendings, I would be terrified to make a phone call about, you know, the patient, right? Because, well, what if they ask me something I don't know, or, you know, I didn't want to look silly in front of them. And I wanted to make sure I have all my, all my information in front of me and correct. So I'd lay out all the papers. This is back when it was, you know, paper charting and all, you know, with, <laughs> with the, big fat chart. And uh, yeah, it took a little while to overcome that. But with time and experience, um, eventually that got better. So yeah, lots of things happening, lots of things going on. And we're always looking for uh, new ways to uh, help the students to connect their didactic with their clinical rotations in a clinical setting and, and bring those two components together in simulation and tie it all together. And that's what we're really trying to do. That's, that's great. Thank you so much, Natalie. Uh, and NYU is quite a, a leader on this, but uh, I, I wanna go off script a bit. I wanna ask Renee quickly and Albert, do you have a simulation component in your residency program? I ask this because Mount Sinai actually has, I just met the director of the uh, simulation in the emergency room and they're doing specific emergency room combined with medicine and medical school and the nursing school at Mount Sinai, which is um, you know, from Beth Israel. So do you have something like that in your residency programs? Let's start with Albert. Yes. So Dr. Lim, we have in the residency program uh, for the whole year, we dedicate two or three of those seminars uh, to simulation. And that's an all day uh, seminar that's done in the simulation center. Um, and that was pre-pandemic. When the pandemic happened, we transitioned to uh, low fidelity simulation, and we have yet to go back to the same um, 
context of simulation that we did. We actually have a, um, a well-equipped simulation center right around Dr. Theodore's neighborhood at Jacoby Hospital. Um, we, uh, our simulation center hosts both uh, a paramedic, a physician, and nurse simulation. So we get to borrow their curriculum and their curriculum is what we use in the simulation that we do with our residents. And it's in the general context of general nursing, like change in patient conditions, handling emergencies, Foley catheter insertion, IV phlebotomy, um, uh, turning in positioning and all that stuff. I had a struggle with turning in position. You think it's so easy to turn uh, someone, but wait when they have 56 tubes. Um, uh, Renee, and then after you answer, Joe will ask the next question. So Renee, do you have a simulation component in your residency? Yeah, department? so Northwell does. We have a big center for simulation. So we will send our, uh, you know, RNs and, and orientees to go out to the system for simulation training, which we can schedule. They have a ton of different uh, simulation training scenarios, if you will. So it just depends on like what area and focus you want to uh, really get prepared and and help with clinical practice. Um, but then we also have an on-site too. So I, I do work at one of the community sites in Northwell. So we are not, we don't have like pediatric services, but specifically in our ER residency program, we do have uh, a, our children's hospital will come out and help run a sim on-site uh, with, with the team not necessarily like the new grads, but with the entire team to kind of help prepare for any pediatric emergencies. And, and we partner with our system hospitals. So yeah, we do. We have both the center that we can send the team out or we can ask, we can actually ask the the staff from the center to come out, not necessarily um, pediatrics. It could be any kind of scenario. If we want them to come out and help run SIM for our new uh, orientees. Thank you so much. Uh, there's lots of things going on in simulation. Uh, uh, there is uh, Colombia, they use pigs to do uh, tracheotomy. And in the army, they use ferrets to intubate uh, ferrets. It mimics neonatal, apparently. So something to, uh, you know, think about. Okay, Joe. Um... Yes, uh, coming back on one thing that Natalie mentioned, EPIC. Um, electronic medical records and whatnot. Um, we'll direct this to Renee actually and to Alan and Vanessa. I'm sure they can chime in since they use this every day now in practice. Uh, what do you see as the challenges of new grads in terms of electronic health records and informatics? Um, let's start with Renee and then we can go to Vanessa and Alan afterwards. Sure, so I guess it just depends on like, um... I know when I started as a, a new grad, I didn't have that experience to really understand the electronic medical record, but I also started, I, I started back in the day when we wrote on paper. So having that, I can't imagine, um, you know, what it's like now. I don't know if you have those, I'm, I'm assuming NYU has it, but like I, I graduated from Michigan State. I can't say that they have some sort of class that like teaches you how to chart an epic. You learn that kind of on orientation or you go to a class, come back. And sometimes that class is not even the best, if you will. <laughs> you learn really like from your preceptor and like what to chart and how to chart. And I think for me in my director and quality and magnet hat, um, you know, helping a new grad really conceptualize like the whole entirety of the patient stay and everything, the care that's provided. Sometimes that can be challenging, I think, to go back and see the big picture because everything's either in a drop down or a different tab. And it's kind of hard to see that. I know when I started, we had the long, I was an ICU nurse, had the long paper chart so we could flip back and like look days, weeks, and see the whole picture and see the whole flow of the 24 hours. So it can be, I think, as a new grad, it can be challenging. So we try to do our best to support them with that, our preceptors. You know, we encourage them to look back at multiple shifts to like see trends. Um, we encourage them to look at the diff views differently on our electronic me medical record, um, especially when it comes to trends in labs or like patients test results and things like that. Um, so it's just really supporting that uh, learning and seeing the whole big picture with your patient. So that's pr pretty much what we stress with our preceptors to help support that. Great. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Vanessa. 
Oh, it's okay. I was just yeah. unmuting myself just in case. Um, oh, no, I think Renee um, makes a really great point. Um, I didn't think of it till after she mentions it, but I think getting the big picture from Epic is very hard. And going back into H&Ps from like day after day and everyone just copies and pastes what the other person said. <laughs> so a lot of things get lost in Epic despite the crazy amount of information that's on there. Um, sometimes what saves me is going to rounds and I get a big picture from rounds from the attending and from the residents and they give you a good idea and then I can work off of that. But I think being from my generation where I didn't do paper charts, in fact, when Epic is on downtime during nights, it's my biggest nightmare nightmare because you have to paper chart and that's like my arch nemesis. Um, I didn't struggle with Epic. It was like a very fancy Excel with a ton of tabs and a ton of like just boxes to fill in. Um, but in the CCU where I work, we just have so many devices that don't speak to each other and they don't, or like the informatics themselves don't work with each other. And somehow I and you, Brad, had to get all that information, plug it into the computer and then make something of it. Like I have to make clinical decisions and say, hey, I don't think this patient has proper cardiac output from all of these devices I just plugged into the computer. So there's a lot of room to improve Epic, but as a new grad, I think learning it in our new generation, it's not terrible. It's when you have a ton of information that you have to somehow plug in and make work of it. <laughs> and to piggyback off of uh, Vanessa, um, as a new grad, I think it is very overwhelming to learn not just the clinical and the physical aspect of being a nurse and taking care of patients, but now, assuming you have no history, no background in um, using EMRs, you have to learn a new system, especially with Epic. There's a million different ways to chart one thing. And if you have multiple preceptors, like in the situation that we have now, you, you'll have people that chart one way, and then you'll have another, you know, another preceptor teach you how to chart another way. And they're like, oh, I'm my way is the right way. And you sort of have to figure it out yourself. And you can customize your Epic. And so everyone's Epic looks different. So learning it is very difficult. So what I've actually like started doing for my preceptees is like if they're a new grad you know we'll teach you the physical stuff first and then the charting can come later we can dedicate a day to like figure out hey this is what's important this is how you find your information and like everyone mentioned them everyone copies the h &Ps. like you really have to learn how to filter notes just to like get the information about your patient because there's a million like different notes from different services and so yeah Take your time with Epic or whatever EMR. All scripts, I think, also exist. But yeah, take your time. For, for in in that regard, do you find yourself uh, not having time to read the chart? Uh, uh, we say chart, but you know it's not a chart. It's a, do do you have actually time to read what's been written? Uh, I'll take this one. Uh, so yes, so. You, what you'll see a lot of nurses do um, is like they'll come in like 15, 20 minutes earlier before their shift, figure out their assignment, and then dive deep into the chart, you know, figure out why the patient's here, what's going on, what the plan of care is, and what procedures may happen, and that. But other than that, sometimes you may be starting your shift into a mess, and then you have to, you don't, you don't have time sometimes. So that's why some nurses try to be proactive and, you know, come in a little earlier to read. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, one thing I can, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, one thing I can say to like piggyback off of this from like a provider side of this, being that I work with Alan in the MICU is, you know, it can be overwhelming, especially to read provider notes. Um, and I'm not quite sure how Vanessa, like the CCU works in your hospital, but like our CCU in, in particular, you know, it's a closed ICU, but then we have multiple teams like taking care of patients like EP, you know, heart failure. So it can be overwhelming to try and look through all of these different provider notes. Um, generally, even as a provider, what I do, because I'm trying to learn, like, for example, if I'm covering MICU and CCU, that's 28 critical care patients. I will generally look at the like goals of care or whatever for that day. And then even if you look at a provider's note, yes, there's a lot of copying and pasting. There's a tab on Epic, height copying, pasting. And usually they will bold or they'll put in the new stuff that day. And I generally try to look at like overnight events and then I go 
literally right down to the bottom to like the one liner to know why the patient's necessarily in the hospital or what's going on and then the plan. Um, but it can be very, like Alan said, if you walk into a mess, like you have codes going on and patients are crashing, it's hard to figure that out right from the get go. Um, but that's great advice. I mean, either way, and especially like for the med surge people going into med surge, when you start with six patients, it is definitely hard to go out there and try to learn six patients all at once with your report from seven to seven 30. So, um, and I will turn this over to Eileen again, uh, so she can ask the last question. Okay, thanks, Joe. So this question is for Vanessa. Vanessa, in what way do you think your manager, coworkers, or nursing educator created a conducive environment for you uh, as a new grad? Thank you. It's a great question because I feel like I, my orientation to my floor is very particular. Um, and I know it's really hard to share this with other floors because of the nursing shortage and things like that. But I was actually one of the first new grads to be hired on my floor after like five years. And I know that's not normal anymore. That's not a thing. But um, my floor, my manager, my nursing educator, they all and my coworkers, they all knew I was a new grad and they were all like prepared when I arrived. They were like, this is Vanessa. She's the new grad. Um, and um, they all put into place um, like steps for me to build. And my first few weeks of orientation were just basic nursing, which I don't feel like always happens because I didn't start off on a med search floor. You know, I started off in a intense ICU floor. And my first couple of days on the floor with my preceptor was just learning how to be a nurse first. Like, this is what an IV looks like. This is what an 18 gauge is. This is what a flush is. This is where the saline bags are. And Sometimes that's really overwhelming when you're going into something straight on without that knowledge that everyone around you is just trying to really build you as a nurse first and then as a critical care nurse. I didn't touch anything critical care for the first six months, for the first six, um, three or four weeks, I think. It was like really basic step down patients. They even sent me to the step down floor so I can learn how to nurse and learn how to navigate Epic. And I feel like that was so conductive to me as a new grad and it's so hard to do nowadays and I and I don't expect every floor to do that and I think I was very lucky in that case but um it was so good for me it built such a confidence in my coworkers, knowing that I would walk in and they would say whatever you need I know you you know whatever you don't know even if you think it's silly just come to me and I was never afraid of I was always afraid of making a mistake but I always knew that I could fall on someone and I knew I can like run to anyone on that floor and they would all just come and help me um, my first admission I was shaking <laughs> but everyone came to my room and they helped settle my patient they said this is what you do this is where we're at and until this day I think everyone still runs into my room <laughs> so overall I think my manager really picked out specific preceptors for me, which again is also very hard, but he chose people that he thought would be able to baby feed me, right? Like in some ways, like really be able to do those steps with me and allow me to say, hey, I don't know how to flush this IV. I don't know how to clean this pick line. Like he allowed, they allowed me that space to feel like I didn't know anything. And my even my nursing educator created a whole program for me. Every day I had, whole, every week I had homework and I would have to go in and say, this is what um, cardiac output is. It's like little by little. And they built my knowledge up until I was doing like um, continuous renal replacement. And now I'm on my own. But even to this day, I know I can run to any of them and they would any, you know, help me in any way. And I think I was very fortunate and I wish everyone had that um, experience as a new grad. Um, and if I ever get the chance to be a preceptor or a manager, wherever my life takes me, I would like it to be in that way because it was so helpful. And I'm really fortunate for my coworkers and my manager. Um, I think Kevin would love to hear that, Vanessa. <laughs> I won't tell her. I won't. We'll email him tonight. Kevin is the manager of <laughs> Vanessa. And, you know, uh, listening to that, it, it, it gives me a lot of hope 
right? That there is a lot of good out there. Um, we, we hear a lot of bad things about, you know, not enough training, um, bad recept receptors and burnout, those types of things. So uh, this is a sort of a great counterpoint to that. So um, Al, um, we, we, we invite our audience to ask a question. You can type it in the Q&A, but I'd, I'd like Alan to also to answer that question. Uh, how is it at Sinai? Uh, um, how did your coworkers, perceptor, percept, um, your your team uh, help you along to be practice ready? Uh, so like Vanessa, my unit actually had not taken on any new grad nurses for like, I want to say four or five years. So everyone was on, you know, on aware. They were keeping their eyes out for me and they were like, hey, you need anything, you know, and then, you know, just whatever was basic nursing skills was whatever was second nature for them like it was new to me and so they always were very proactive in saying oh hey like this is how you um do a central line change a uh, central line dressing change or you know this is um our our pumps or you know this is how you work our monitor you know stuff that is you know very basic um for them was new to me and so they were very good so i was very fortunate to have um, excellent preceptors and coworkers to teach me um, the ins and outs of the, I guess, how to be a nurse first, and then the critical care stuff came later. So, yeah. You you work with Joe, right? Yes. So yes, what, what, we Joe, work together. What, is is yeah. Joe a good preceptor? Don't answer that. Um, <laughs> that's another he name. must say no. yes, no. Um, I think uh, to piggyback off of Alan, just because we do work together and Vanessa can probably attest to this. I know nurses in general, you know, dread night shift and everyone wants to get off night shift as soon as possible. But as a night shift worker myself, and I've been night shift basically my whole career is I do find it actually, you know, when there's less people, we act more necessary, not as a team at night and it becomes a little more autonomous for learning and nursing in general. Um, so not that everyone should stay on night shift or be on night shift, but I do suggest doing it at some point in your career just so, and I think it builds confidence too. Um, I know Alan works with me on nights. I can't remember what you said, Vanessa, if you're nights or not, but if you can attest to something like that, like I find even me as a, the provider, like the NP on the unit, I find myself learning more um, when there's less people because you're put into situations that you have to figure it out with your team. And that includes everyone like, you know, Renee and Natalie were saying like the whole interdisciplinary healthcare team, the doctors, you know, the respiratory therapists and whatnot. Um, but it, it's a great experience. So that's that's just great insight. Uh, we, we're going to open it up for Q and A. But if, while you're preparing for your questions, our audience, you know, we'd love to answer your question. Uh, Dr. Theodore, uh, would you like to share some thoughts on new grad transitioning to a practice? Or there are multiple types of transition. It could be transitioning to a different role. You may be not a new grad anymore, but maybe you're changing units. So you came from the OR and now you're going to go to med surge or you came from a staff and now you're going to be a manager. Um, you have some words of wisdom for our um, audience. Um, you will have to unmute yourself. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure if there are words of wisdom, but we, we experienced some of the same, many of the same challenges I've heard discussed uh, tonight. Um, of course, uh, we're aided with our very robust NRP program and our preceptorship program. Um, you know, being the largest public health care system in the country, uh, where we accept nurses directly into our specialty areas, into our L&D, into critical care, and our ED, uh, clearly we face similar challenges. You brought that up uh, because our, uh, we'd like our grads to uh, apply their talents at the Health and Hospital Corporation. Uh, Dr. Bellaro here is an NYU alum. I'm also one of his staff. I teach for Bellevue also. I'm everywhere. Um, but um, so there's opportunities. So expand your horizons. Uh, there's uh, 
places beyond Langone and Kimmel, right? Um, and uh, now I'm, I'm going to see the uh, chat box, uh, question box. So there's a question here from um, Emma. For the new grads, do you feel that it was too overwhelming to enter critical care right away, or do you think it was a good choice? Um, so let's start with Alan, then to Vanessa. Um, I think critical care is just like any other specialty, just like med surge, ER, OR, you're going to be overwhelmed in the beginning, no matter what. Um, having prior experience in general medicine will definitely help build a base of like communication skills, organizational skills, knowing your system, how to talk to, you know, inter the interdisciplinary team, as well as basic clinical skills. However, I don't think it's an absolute necessity and I think it is doable. It, it requires a lot of um, extracurricular learning, though. So read your textbooks, read your, use your resources. Yeah, that's I agree actually, with that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's great. So, and, and, and Vanessa, you can answer that too, because it's one of the follow-up questions. Where do you find your information after you graduate? Now that you're not in a three-credit course somewhere anymore, how do you teach yourself along the way, other than, of course, the one-on-one -on -one at the bedside? So go ahead, Vanessa. Um, I think so to answer the first question, as long as you're willing to put in a lot of extra work to learn on your own, I think it's doable. It's challenging in its own ways. But I think med surge is very challenging in its own. I think it's a specialty as well. So it's really it's not so black and white. And um, as far as where I get my resources from, believe it or not, I took Fidel uh, Dr. Lim's um, critical care class, and I still refer to a lot of the resources he gave us at first. Um, there's also up to date. There's um, if you're in critical care, there's a critical care nursing book that I often read. But um, when you get into an organization, you should have access to up to date. And I have it on my phone, and I will up to date anything, whatever medication, whatever sim, like whatever um, you know diagnosis. Whatever it is, I any I will up to date it, and that's where I get most of my information, and that's where the doctors are getting their information from. The residents are looking at up to date, so <laughs> that's really my best advice. I don't know if Alan has any other ones. Oh, on YouTube, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, uh, uh, Medcram. That's that's one of my favorites. So, um, Farah would like to know if one starts in an area of nursing and does not like it, what are the options to transfer? So I'd like to uh, direct this to Dr. Bilaro. Uh, say you have a staff, a new grad, hired him to labor and delivery, and they realize they don't want that role anymore uh, or during uh, their uh, you know, early orientation. What, what are the options? So uh, at New York City Health and Hospitals, we have a little bit of an advantage because we have 11 hospitals all over the five boroughs. And so if uh, a nurse, for example, is miserable in one area because of the commute, right, we can easily tell them, you know, if you live in Brooklyn, why don't you look at our Brooklyn hospitals and, and look at that if, if your commute is uh, making you miserable. Um, we also have a lot of um, specialties, our 11 hospitals. So um, a, uh, a resident, for example, in post-acute uh, would like to go into critical care from a nursing home specialty and have anxiety because maybe they are treading new waters for the first time and are not really to make, uh, not really ready to make the plunge yet. So we tell them about what happens during orientation, during transition. And, uh, you know, they're not gonna uh, leave you uh, swimming in the ocean by yourself <laughs> with the sharks coming after you. They would be uh, supporting you with, uh, you know, um, the orientation to the specialty, the nurse residency program that we began to offer in 2019, as well as the preceptors, um, in the specialty areas that are a little bit differently structured than the preceptors in a post-acute setting, for example. So we give them that context and uh, that seems to work for a lot of our uh, staff that instead of resigning, right, from our uh, hospitals, they switch around specialties, switch around sites until they find a comfort zone. Dr. Lim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Allow me to also add to what Dr. Mm -hmm. Ballara said. 
uh, while he is speaking from the system's perspective, at the individual hospital perspective, we most certainly do the same thing. Uh, when we have nurses in the ED or critical care who aren't quite making it there, our orientation, there are 16 weeks in those areas. And we have a weekly, a one-to-one -one with the preceptor, with the educator uh, and the new orientee and someone from the unit. So we get to identify uh, areas for improvement early on. So we always provide an opportunity for that person to rotate to another specialty. Uh, because not only am I the director of nursing education, but I'm also the retention officer. So we do all that we can to retain our nurses. Thank you, uh, Dr. Theodore. Uh, we're, we're getting some very great questions in here um, and um, our panelists can answer them. Um, and I'd like to ask Renee uh, this question from Shannon. Uh, have you, uh, what would you do if, you know, you're short staff and um, do you feel over, uh, empowered to talk to the higher ups? How, how, is, how do you empower your nurse residents to, you know, step up and say, okay, you know, I think this is a compromising situation. I don't feel comfortable about this. I mean, it's the spirit of shared governance. I mean, it's really all about being, you know, embracing magnet. I mean, that is my role as the director of magnet for our hospital is really just having that structural um, empowerment for and ensuring that there's safe spaces where they can escalate and they can, you know, escalate anything that uh, they think is concerning, uh, using team steps, uh, using huddles, debriefs, uh, gathering uh, a team quick discussion to review or debrief a situation and look at what we can do to better support each other as a team. Um, also utilizing their mentor uh, with our mentorship program. That's something that, you know, they can call upon for help and assistance when it comes to, uh, maybe it's something that's not urgent, but something that's been lingering that they wanna talk about and re kind of role play the conversation um, before they escalate. Uh, but obviously using team steps, um, especially when it's an emergent situation is really important. Um, and yeah, just, having leadership that's authentic and transformational, that that's there and present that steps in. I know when I round on the floors, I'll help out. I'll ask if there's anything I can do to help. Um, you know, even if it's clinical, it's answering a call bell, checking in on another patient while they're in the other room, like just to support them in that practice. Because even though I'm in this role, I'm still a nurse, you know what I mean? So it doesn't change the fact that we're all doing the same thing together to care for those patients and make, making sure everyone's supported. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks. I just wanted to add one one brief point. I also think that uh, it's important that new grads are not afraid to ask for the help that they need, right? So don't be a hero. Don't be drowning there, you know, overloaded with patients. You know, if if you're not sure of something, ask. If you need help, ask. There are so many people around who will be more than happy to provide that support. Just don't be scared because everybody at one point was a new grad <laughs> and we all needed help. Uh, Natalie, you, you used to be a nurse manager, right? Did you have a nurse managerial role at some? Uh, I was the charge nurse um, for five years on my unit. So at first, you know, the nurses used to rotate, but then they created uh, a steady charge position. So I was that charge nurse on, on our unit. So that was 31 patients, uh, eight post-op unit beds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do we still do the simulation with the uh, residency program that used to come to back to NYU to Myers for simulation? Is it still happening? Uh, yes. So we haven't done one in a while, but uh, the plan is for them to come back. They've been using NYSEM across the street and, um, you know, maybe you know, with the shortage, their numbers have significantly maybe declined, you know, I don't want to speak, I don't want to say, because I'm not 100% sure, but um, they used to come on almost a monthly basis to do a full day training of simulation with their new, uh, new grads in the nurse residency program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, 
So Joe, there's a question there. I don't know if you answered it already uh, about night shift. I did it for 19 and a half years. I think I did just fine. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm answering it right now for the person actually. Oh, okay. um, yeah, I mean, definitely I've done it for, like I said, I think I've, I'm coming up on 15 years. So uh, you just, yeah, it gets tiring at times, but I enjoy it at the same time. Advice for that in the night shift is, you know, like everything else in life, it's a mindset right? It's a mindset. Uh, if you resist it, you will exhaust yourself. So uh, I used to take, you know, 50 milligrams of Benadryl just to sleep. And I, one day I decided I will give up that life. So I, I don't need medication to sleep. Uh, so I don't know, Eileen, do you have experience working night shift? What, what is your words of wisdom on coping with the night shift? Um, the night shift, I think you just have to have a well-balanced uh, life, um, scheduling yourself. You know, you will learn uh, not to maybe schedule yourself three nights in a row, um, you know, because so, when you first start, you, you know, some people say, oh, I like to work three nights in a row and then I'll have four or five days off. Uh, but it could be not as beneficial for you for your health. So I try, I try to space out my night shifts, um, you know, maybe to do two nights in a row, couple nights off and then one one um you know one uh, the third shift uh, towards the later of uh, of the week that helps me out and just self-care helps me out um uh, and kind of starting to stay awake uh when i have my days off and enjoy my time off when i can get it yeah yeah i like this comment in there <laughs> the days of too many people calling calling you uh, I, I, I used to think that way. And then I became day shift after my hospital closed. And I love the day shift too, uh, the conversation with the patient. So uh, as like I said, it's, it's a mindset. So um, maybe Janet can bring up the, the slide. Uh, we were, we're about to conclude our gathering. This has been a robust uh, discussion and this is not the beginning. Hopefully this is the, 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 the beginning. Uh, this is not the end. This is hopefully it's the beginning of, of uh, connecting with uh, Vanessa or Alan. Uh, they're, they're, I'm sure they have other plans with their next career move. I know of Alan because uh, Alan and I, uh, you know, interact, uh, you know, over other things. So, yeah, as we have uh, started with the topic of, is it possible or is it impossible to have uh, new grads being ready? So I have some uh, suggestions. This is the last slide um, that uh, we can think about either your role as a manager, a preceptor, a, a CNO, uh, those types of things. So what can we do? I think Vanessa alluded to this already earlier, you know, that psychosocial support, um, apprenticeship model, right? Which was done for many, many years. You go into the role, you get trained on the job and here's a, uh, a support uh, for, a, for a while. Uh, academic partnership, so hospital and Langone and Myers would have something, you know, of an enduring type of partnership. Immersion model, so some hospitals, some schools, they have this capstone. Student goes in for eight weeks or sometimes the entire semester doing, you know, 40 hours a week shift. Uh, dedicated education unit, some hospitals have that, Columbia, a student is accepted into the program, you go to the same unit for the rest of the time, you get trained and with the idea they'll hire you over there. You have clinical nurse specialists that you could uh, help with, uh, you know, your uh, transition residency program we talked about. And of course, uh, Dr. Bilaro has mentioned training the preceptor. Uh, we are in that state wherein our preceptor may have a different philosophy of how this is done, right? Um, I remember my preceptor Sharon, she barked at me all day. Uh, I was terrified of the woman, but I learned a lot from here, uh, her out of fear, right? I, 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 I was really afraid of her, uh, but I learned a lot, but I, I wish that I didn't, I wasn't afraid of her. So I train preceptors at hospital for special surgery and we, we get them those types of things. And then mentorship was mentioned. So uh, whatever that means to you, uh, sign up, pick someone, uh, uh, be paired with somebody at work, friends or uh, other colleagues who will uh, coach you along the way. You know, sportsmen, ha uh, sports people have coaches. Why not nurses, right? So lots of things we can do to make it easier. So um, 
let's stay hopeful. And with that, I would pass the uh, uh, podium to Eileen to give us a closing remarks. Thank you, Dr. Lim. So thank you to our panelists for joining us tonight. Uh, and my apologies for my um, technical difficulties, right? Even as an experienced nurse like myself has to learn and be flexible. And as new grads, you also have to learn and be flexible and learn new things, right? So what we learned in this uh, webinar, right? So we have to always continuously work with the doctors, with the other departments around us, learning how to be a preceptor as a new grad, is something new to the new, to the new folks coming into the nursing field nurse residency program um, is a really great support for the new grads. And that would be great if you have that in your institution where you're going to be working. Um, and then also uh, on the other side, right? Um, you know, not only getting all these resources and the support, but you also have to do self-care like Alan said, uh, and getting all that other support from your, from your um, coworkers, from your preceptor and from your supervisor. So it's really good to um, not just a one way, um, you know, um, reaching out, right? But you can also reach out to them because they're there to help you out. Um, so those are some of my takeaways. Um, you know, I'm sure we have more lively discussions coming up in our future webinars, but I just wanna thank you to our guests who attended tonight. You'll be receiving a survey later this evening, and we encourage you to share your feedback about the program. Please join us for the upcoming Myers Marvel event. Uh, and we will be speaking with Jacqueline Fawcett on November 16th, and hope you have a good evening. Have a good, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, Eileen. And Vanessa is about to go save lives now at the CCU. Uh, so that's, that's amazing, um, very impressive. So thank you all, be well, do good work and stay in touch.